Hey y'all, Shane here. You love Amazon, don't you? You do a lot of shopping there, right? I think we all do. <laughs> well, one great way you can support Lipkin Under Attack is by doing all of your shopping through our Amazon affiliate link. It costs you nothing extra, and we get a cut. Getting ready to purchase a bunch of books on Austrian economics? A knife for your bug out bag? Bulk additions to your food storage? Make your purchase by first visiting libertyunderattack.com forward slash Amazon. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash Amazon. And thank you in advance for your support. I'm sure some folks will still participate in politics, hoping they can find a benevolent ruler to at least mitigate uh, some of the infringements in place now. But guys, that's, that's, that's a road to nowhere. It's a road to beatdowns on the street, extortion, and democide, with an even greater loss of freedom year after year, election after election. And it's, it's one of the most vicious falsehoods perpetuated throughout the ages. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, naive notion that politics can set you free. Uh, and that's why I've been so harsh on the anti-libertarian libertarian party, uh, because, uh, as I've said before, the people are sick of politics, the left-right paradigm. So what do they do? They give them more politics. It's, uh, it's the most uh, uh, insincere and ingenuine thing you can do to a fellow human being. It really is dangerous to be an anarchist, and it, it will only get, I mean, it, you know, as per kind of the, the stages of Agoras and that Konkin kind of laid out, it, it, it's going to get worse, and then it's going to get better, but, you know, when, when's it, when's it going to start getting better? You're listening to Liberty Under Attack Radio, and now your host, Shane. And welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for anarchism in action. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the communist state of Illinois. This podcast and everything found on the website is covered by a BIPCOT no government license. This allows reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the blood cheese thereof. You can learn more at BIPCOT.org. So before I jump, before I, you know, we jump into this episode, I want to point you in the direction of uh, the Liberty Under Attack Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Liberty Under Attack. Uh, there are two new uh, episodes on there. I had two uh, guest appearances recently, and I uh, decided to uh, throw those up there as uh, Patreon exclusives. Not going to release those out on the normal podcast feed uh, until it gets to a time when uh, when I don't have any uh, you don't have an episode ready for uh, for one of the weeks. Uh, so if you want to go, uh, you know, help support us, uh, for, uh, get early access to those for as little as a dollar a month. Uh, you can just go to Liberty Under or uh, go to Patreon.com forward slash Liberty Under Attack and uh, get early access to those uh, those interviews. So. Today, I'm, I'm joined again by uh, Kyle Braden from the Last Bastille blog. Uh, last week, we discussed uh, vigilantism. It was supposed to be uh, one episode discussing all of these things, but uh, that episode turned out to be about two and a half hours, and I figured it'd probably be best not to drop a three and a half or four hour episode on you uh, in one go. Uh, so, uh, like I said, Kyle's back with me. Uh, how's it going, man? Not too bad, not too bad. How about yourself? Oh, doing doing well. Doing well. Can't complain. A little tired, but, uh, you know... Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, a, a lot of people are, are are dealing with a lot worse shit. So I guess, you know, a little, uh, little you know, tiredness isn't that big of a deal. <laughs> no rest for the weary, right? Uh, no, no. And it's been, yeah, it's, it's been busy. I'm, I, I just, uh, before we, before we started uh, recording, I've been working on getting these, the last two uh, publications from that last batch. I think I talked about them. Maybe I talked about it over here at Liberty Under Attack, but uh, the new batch of like uh, six or seven libertarian publications from the uh, 70s to 90s. Uh, I've got uh, I've got one full one left that I haven't touched yet, and uh, I've got about uh, five more pages to do uh, of this uh, of uh, low cost living notes. So it's uh, almost completed, and then I'll send it off to to my proofreader, and uh, we'll get uh, get those all all of those out for you guys. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, so let's let's go ahead and get into it, Kyle. So so last week we talked about vigilantism and went pretty heavily into uh, that subject. About two and a half hours worth uh, went into a lot of uh, nerdy stuff that uh, that I think you that you uh, you kind of enjoy. I uh, gave you crap for that last week uh, last week, uh, <laughs> but uh, but we didn't uh, we we didn't really get into uh, uh, I guess the last two subjects: assassination politics and avenging angels, a concept proposed by Rayo. Uh, so that's what we're going to do today, and I'm hoping we can tackle both of these. 
uh, in uh, in one shot. So when we were talking about preparing for this episode, uh, before when and this is for the assassination politics section. That's where we're going to work towards now. Uh, you mentioned something, uh, uh, libertarian jackals, an article by uh, Nick Roberts, uh, which actually uh, predated uh, Jim uh, Jim Bell's proposal of you know assassination politics. So uh, why don't you uh, tell the listeners a little about a little about that? Sure. There was an article that was originally published in the Libertarian Alliance back in 1989 by one Nick Roberts. And these were actually the British libertarians and a publication uh, such over there. So this is not uh, of an American origin, uh, but it was entitled In Praise of Jackals, Assassination and Moral Defense Policy. And uh, I was so impressed and thought that what Mr. Roberts had to offer was so unique that I republished it in full on, on the blog so people could kind of uh, see that, but also offered a, a PDF copy of the original article in its original format for free download as well. So the examples that Roberts uses that he talks about uh, so-called free shires, uh, such as areas between Kent and the Fens or from Lancaster to Berwick, and obviously he's talking about England. Uh, so there's that. The main argument that Mr. Roberts makes is that assassins and the use of assassination as a tool of warfare is actually preferable to what would be considered, you know, you know <laughs> conventional government warfare in terms of like troop invasions and so forth, in terms of lessening the property damage as well as lives lost. Right, right, and I'll certainly mirror uh, mirror that uh, that or not mirror it, but I'll, I'll certainly post a link to uh, to that essay. Um, so, so, so I guess uh, what what you're saying then is uh, uh, that, or I I, I I remember reading this uh, probably a couple of months back uh, when you first introduced it to me, but but I guess the the gist of what Nick Roberts was trying to do here was. Uh, I guess using uh, using libertarian jackals to to prevent or stop war. Yes, exactly. And uh, I think a quote or two by Mr. Roberts himself would be good here. And this is later on down the article. Uh, but it's essentially his rationale of assassination. So Mr. Roberts says, quote, this is why I propose as the mainstay and front line of the defense of a free society, a policy of selective assassination of government leaders. Morally, this proposal is sound. Top-level assassination hurts only volunteers, the willing tyrants. It leaves the innocent alive. If rulers choose to rule and to go to war, their lives become forfeit because they are acting coercively towards their subjects and intended conquests. As a natural rights libertarian, I do not consider that the Hitlers, the Kennedys, the Gaddafis, or the Attilas have any right to mercy. Those who plan and order the deaths of millions deserve to die. After all, who else is there to blame? Close quote. Uh, he goes on in more detail, but essentially he's uh, making both a philosophical and, yes, even utilitarian arguments in favor of what would be considered the, uh, the libertarian assassins would essentially be these jackals. Hence the article being uh, being entitled "In Praise of Jackals." So instead of having huge standing armies, and even as an alternative to the colonial American idea of like the militia system, you would instead just have these jackals that would be uh, hired and commissioned to uh, to essentially go out and commit tyrannicide. Right, right, and I I really I really like that. I really do. Obviously, uh, more obviously, you know, I think he I think the moral case is obviously there. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I love the way that he puts that. I really do. Uh, and I obviously I love that proposal as well, uh, you know, using uh, using libertarian jackals, uh, you know, to to stop or prevent war. I think that's a worthwhile effort, unfortunately, uh, or maybe maybe fortunately. I'm not I'm not quite sure. I guess it kind of depends upon. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, you know, haven't seen that yet because uh, obviously war is still quite rampant and I'm not sure. You know, I, I don't know. What, what do you think, Kyle? If, uh, you know, libertarian jackals, you know, started doing this tomorrow, uh, do, you, do you think, uh, you know, war would end anytime soon? Not right away. However, I would suggest this. I think Nick Roberts' uh, proposal is a, uh, a way of trying to is – a, is a potential answer to the question of how do you finance – wait a minute to go back to the previous episode – how do you finance vigilante efforts? 
And if the vigilantes were okay with assassinations and committing assassinations themselves, then they uh, they could be hired to carry those out and so forth. Um, so that so that's a kind of another way of tying it in together, uh, so to speak. Uh, there is one other paragraph from. Roberts' paper I do want to read that kind of highlights something here. Sure. Mr. Roberts said, quote, Now, you may recoil, sickened by my brutality in suggesting such a scheme. Consider this. A government soldier is one among millions. He is expensively trained using stolen money to operate on a continental or even global battlefield. His weapons are so deadly and have such a great range that he cannot fail to kill many nonviolent, non-volunteer civilians. In statist war, millions of innocents die. Not so with the assassin. He is one among a hundred or so colleagues. His weapons are small and capable of a minimum of bloodshed and destruction. He is trained to kill the guilty, despots and their murderous hirelings. He is indoctrinated to leave innocent foreigners unharmed. This is because his employers do not want foreign outrage to force the democracies to invade the free shires and confiscate their businesses. Only the guilty die, close quote. Now, just to kind of paraphrase what Robert said elsewhere in the article, it's not uh, – part of his argument, too, is not just uh, – you know <laughs> – Financed assassinations are preferable to war. It's not just that. It's also even for uh, folks who want to go about abolishing the state uh, and how that might at least partially play out, uh, assassinations are much more preferable than, than going toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, the states and, uh, you know, their, their military forces and, like, you know, their artillery versus your uh, you, artillery, their infantry versus your infantry, their air force versus your air force, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, so if I'm if I'm understanding correctly, what he's arguing is that you know if, if uh, you know if this, if a free society free society did exist, uh, obviously it would be really hard to uh, hard or damn near impossible to compete with uh, these massive nation states. But uh, one thing that could be used as an advantage is you know these libertarian jackals, right? To to try to sustain that and and try to I guess maybe maybe as a way of deterrence. Uh, from having uh, from having the you know these uh, these nation states mess with uh, mess with the uh, free society maybe. Yes, but it was also not just in some future hypothetical, whatever the heck. He was also even saying to even aid the transition f away from nation states towards presumably something resembling uh, a more voluntarist uh, kind of uh, social, social uh, natural social order, as Hop would put it, and such, would be through these jackals to take out the statists of today. You know the ones who conduct things like democide. You know where the where governments uh, purposely murder their own citizens. And remember, the democide statistics specifically exclude war. Um, and so, for for folks who are familiar with the democide and all that, uh, the idea, Mr. Roberts' idea here of jackals, is an answer to the problem of democide caused by the state. Right, right, and and, and you mentioned the transition from from nation states to uh, I guess uh, free societies. Uh, I also, you know, what, what the next thing we're going to talk about, uh, you know, assassination politics. Jim Bell's proposal, I think, would be absolutely huge uh, in that transition as well. Before I jump forward to that, uh, is there anything else you'd like to mention in regards to uh, Nick Roberts and the Libertarian Jackals? Um, you know, you mentioned a moment ago about why haven't we we seen anything like this uh, yet? I would suggest there may be two, possibly three answers. I think one potential answer is it's already happening, but it's underreported, and the mainstream media, which is owned by uh, vested special interests who are more in line with the state than not, uh, are specifically avoiding s stories that kind of suggest that uh, the statists who run governments and uh, are, as some people would say, the globalists, uh, are being actively taken out slowly, but they are. And thus the stories are being underreported. However, that uh, the only problem with that uh, potential answer is that now we're getting to an issue of trying to prove a negative, yeah, uh, which of course, yeah, which exactly. of course, that's the only problem with that potential answer. Uh, as would be the case if you know if we were in a court of law, so to speak, trying to prove a negative and all that. You know, issues of due process and such. Uh, another potential answer would be 
well, okay, yes, the assassins would have to be paid, but who's going to pay them? Or more importantly, how are they going to be paid? And if there was a way to pay them without uh, the status kind of with the bludgies uh, trying to investigate and figure out who's financing the jackals and all that uh, would probably be another, uh, uh, probably a better answer as to why we haven't seen more jackals uh, taking out uh, this dictator, that dictator, this prime minister, that president, or even probably more uh, importantly, uh, that secretary of state, uh, the other uh, bureaucrat, more mid-level bureaucrats. It doesn't have to be people who are in the public eye all the time. You know, usually some um, tin pot uh, wannabe dictator who you never really see mentioned in the newspapers or, or in the media at all, but they hold quite an amount of power, and they're people you've never even heard of. You know, the right. so-called civil servants. You know, the uh, the administrative branch of government, as Senator Patrick McCarran called it in the congressional record back in 1946, of course, in the congressional record. So, you know, I mean, there, there's all sorts of tyrants all over the place. And, um, yeah, so that's interesting. So how do you pay the jackals to take out any of these um, uh, enemy belligerents and such? And that, uh, yeah, until that question gets answered, you might not see jackals for quite some time. Well, uh, you know, uh, as per, uh, you know, uh, assassination politics, I think there might be an answer here, uh, especially with uh, the digital cash that, uh, that Jim Bell proposed uh, that does exist now. But before getting into that too much, uh, I, I, we're, we're not going to cover, you know, Jim Bell's entire, you know, his entire, I guess, uh, uh, proposition. We're just not going to do that because we already did that on Liberty Under Attack Radio. Uh, as just, I think that was, it was, I think that might have been the first episode after the direct action series ended. Uh, but if you just go to libertyunderattack.com uh, and search for assassination, actually, uh, the, actually, the, the link to the episode is libertyunderattack.com forward slash assassination politics. And, uh, that'll take you there if you want, uh, you know, an hour, hour plus, uh, you know, discussion on, uh, what he proposed. You can go there. But just a brief overview, real quick. So, in essence, in, in, in an assassination market, individuals would predict, you know, they would, you know, they would, they would try to predict, uh, the time John Smith, we'll just use that as a name, John Smith would die and place a bet, or in other words, a hit. John could be a politician, bureaucrat, mass murderer, etc., and whoever accurately predicts the death of Mr. Smith would be awarded however much was in the pool. Uh, Jim Bell envisioned this being done through public key encryption, and at that time, this would have been in the early 1990s if I remember correctly, uh, and the yet-to-be-created digital cash, uh, as he put it, with various safety measures ensuring the organizers of this market know nothing about the predictor uh, and vice versa. So it's, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, hmm, I wonder when John Smith is going to die. I think he's going to die uh, uh, on December 22nd, 2065. That's, that's going to be my, that's gonna be my, 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 <laughs> my prediction. And, uh, you know, if it, if it comes out that that's right, then you know, uh, then I would win that. I would win. That, I, I would get that that reward for it. Um, so you're just 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 kind of predicting, you know, just 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 uh, you know predicting when uh, you know John Smith uh, uh, would end up dying, and uh, then yeah, the assassin, uh, the person who uh, yeah, the and, and and I guess the the idea here is that the, the obviously the person who predicted it accurately uh, would probably be the assassin himself, right? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's the general presumption, and if I remember correctly, I think Mr. Bell said something to that effect, too, when he originally proposed his idea of uh, assassination politics, or really an assassination market, uh, back in, what was it, the mid-1990s, 95, 96, thereabouts? Right, right, and I will say, uh, no one really heard from Jim Bell for a while. He was harassed by the bludgies, as I'm sure you can imagine, with this with a proposal like this. Uh, he did get on it. He was interviewed uh, maybe a, a year or two ago on a podcast. I'm not going to mention uh, on a you know not very uh, you know uh, I guess not very uh, good character individual. Uh, but uh, this guy did actually snag an interview with Jim Bell, and it's garbage. Uh, I wish I could actually interview Jim Bell because I would have a lot more questions, um, but uh, a lot better questions. <laughs> but but anyways, uh, anyways. So so the the obstacle when when Jim Bell proposed to this was. So the end of the the public key encryption was was available, you know, PGP was around then, but the digital cash wasn't. The di digital cash wasn't. So so now, I mean, you you consider you know 2008 2009 when Bitcoin came around, uh, there was a uh, there was a an assassination market that was opened up. It was I don't think it was actually real, but um, you can find uh, Forbes did an article on it, and uh, apparently people were putting you know bets on uh, uh, on various political leaders around the world. 
uh, and it was done with Bitcoin, which I don't think is the wisest thing to do, especially considering uh, it was pseudonymous to begin with. And uh, now, uh, you know, that's that's certainly, uh, you know, highly questionable. But when it comes to, uh, you know, the, the more advanced cryptocurrencies like uh, Monero and uh, Bitcoin, maybe not more advanced, but more privacy focused, uh, those blockchains exist now. Uh, so as far as assassination politics, assassination markets, uh, those, I, I mean, the technology is here now, Kyle. So uh, as far as, because uh, that's something you raised just a moment ago with, uh, with the libertarian jackals, how, how are they going to be paid? Well, through, uh, through Monero or, uh, you know, Bitcoin or something like that, right? Yeah, that's that's that looks to be the the most realistic uh, mechanism, at least at this point. So yeah, that's something for people to keep in mind is that the blockchain and the various cryptocurrencies, like the poster board Bitcoin, but also the various old coins, didn't really exist in any functional way prior to about two thousand nine or so. So when Jim Bell wrote his essay in, you know, the 90s, uh, he was really kind of ahead of his time is is kind of the bottom line as, as far as that goes. Now, remember, a few years ago, I think it was in about 2013 or so, there was an attempt to put together an assassination market on, I think it was one of the tour only sites or the, the hidden tour or whatever it was called. The Onion address and all that, mm -hmm. uh, that that people can use to the Tor browser, and that's been since taken down. Uh, but it was it was there for a while. Uh, there were various uh, politicians and bureaucrats who did have uh, bounties on their heads. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Barack Obama, who was the uh, who was El Presidente at the time, did not have the highest bounty. That belonged, of course, to former chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, actually had the highest bounty on his head. Uh, but last time I checked, he was still breathing. So I, I guess there's that, I suppose. Um, so yeah, I mean, there there was at least one attempt to kind of try to bring that uh, to fruition. But uh, as far as I'm aware of, everybody that was put on that particular uh, tour site uh, are, are they're still walking around so I guess it didn't do too much I suppose right right yeah and, and you know since since nothing happened then uh, I don't yeah I think that's probably why uh, why it wasn't really pursued that 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 far by I guess probably the uh, the the uh, the bludgies uh, they had a, they had a lot to deal with uh, around that time with the Silk Road and such and I'm sure that took priority because there's actually illegal activity going on there uh, so so yeah, cer certainly interesting. There is one other point I want to make about assassination politics for any of the minarchists that may be listening. And uh, I posted a status on this a few months ago. And the only possible way that so that any sort of government could remain limited, the only the only way a limited government could actually exist is if there is a concom like a, you know you know a, a concomitant assassination market. That's the only way. If uh, politicians know that if they if they do the wrong thing, they're they're going to get killed. Uh, you know, they, they, they'll, you know, they'll listen at that point, right? Because you can have all the lobbying money in the world, but what the hell does it mean if you're dead? So I think that's the only possible way for limited government to exist is if, uh, you know, that, that sort of threat was there at all times. But then, but then again, who would want to be a politician if that was, you know, a constant threat? So I think that would even devolve to, or not even devolve, but evolve to an anarchist society anyways. What do you think, Kyle? Well, obviously, the topic of limited government versus no government is something that does need to be broached on its own merits, uh, because that is a very deep topic that's not only philosophical in nature, but also very uh, includes very utilitarian elements such as uh, details of history and, and also the reality of, of, of economics and so forth and whatever and whatnot. Um, the history of the Patriot Movement, too, is very much entwined with that, with what I believe is the great debate of our time. Uh, I know many people are focused on left versus right, but the I would say the great debate really is limited government versus no government, quite frankly. Um, regarding what more you're getting at, I think the great American experiment in limited government has kind of shown – that the so-called checks and balances that are supposed to be in place because of the three branches of government uh, structured in the, in the way that they are by the Constitution to basically rein in uh, concentrations of power and prevent that or at least disperse the power at, at bare minimum um, doesn't work. Uh, power is concentrated uh, despite these checks and balances, despite 
uh, you know, Senate confirmation hearings of Supreme Court judges, despite, uh, you know, congressional oversight, you know, despite, uh, you know, whatever was supposed to check on the be the check on executive power. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that when you have a Congress that basically you see that's the thing the house of representatives basically wants to rule the country and the u.s senate really wants to rule the world the president is essentially an elected uh dictator a king a sovereign a monarch really and the supreme court or and also the inferior courts as the constitution describes it as are are basically uh kangaroo courts where they can just violate due process and get away with with whatever i mean Remember, I mean, this is the same federal government that uh, basically there are no Fourth Amendment protections for people who use cell phones. Um, that's co that's coming out of the judicial branch. So, I mean, that's that that's kind of the joke here. That's kind of also the reality of it as well. And so, I mean, limited government, is, is it even possible? Um, I don't see any evidence of that as of yet. I think the more important question is, is there any way to – at least um, I don't want to say reign in the power of the state because that's limited government one more time, but more uh, keep the parasitism and, and predatory nature of the state at least from metastasizing too quickly, uh, at least in some ways. And um, or or ideally, you know, get around to, you know, <laughs> moving along the path towards abolition. And I think that assassination markets would be uh, one potentially uh, efficacious avenue to pursue because remember uh, you know that that concept by the Russians that of real politic you know so there's all the civics garbage people learn you know with uh, their uh, their indoctrination and so forth about you know checks and balances and whatever else and then there's real politic which is what actually happens politically and what actually happens is that there are vested special interests of various kinds and flavors who engage in power politics to bully extort and yes bribe that's what lobbying is bribe their fellow men and, and even certain heavy switch hitters, as some of them are refer, refer to each other as, to basically do their special bidding. And that is what democracy is. And that is what a republic is, our, our democratically republic form of government or whatever. Um, that is what it has led to. You know, the system is not broken. It is working exactly as it was designed to. And I think some of the... Uh, more optimistic founders were rather naive in thinking that, well, you know, if we have certain, you know, legal interstices in the Constitution or whatever, that will somehow uh, keep the keep the state in a kind of uh, frozen state of of having a little bit of power, but not too much. And it's been like two centuries, and what has been the result? Right, right. So, so, so your answer is, um, uh, and, and and I I've obviously I, I I tend to agree with you that you know the lim there, a limited government cannot cannot actually exist, uh, but but your answer is that uh, you know maybe assassin assassination markets could be used to, uh, you know, kind of uh, you know delay or at least slow down the uh, the expansion of the state then, or if it was taken up seriously, actually lead to its abolition. Yes, but l hold on, let me use a parallel example too. The Patriots kind of came somewhat close. They were very much promoting, like, for example, it started with promoting the legal interstice of the Second Amendment, but it eventually led to the so-called militia movement as a kind of a subset of the Patriot movement. And that was rather interesting because now we're getting away from – checks and balances and let's let's play like all this let's do all this political posturing and you know hide behind a constitution all that and now we're getting more to the issue of how do we prepare to use force against the state which is what the whole point of the militia movement was not is anymore but was now that's a very interesting question because with the militia movement that was more centering about uh, questions of use of force for example do you pop uh, a feds, you know, head, you know, crack a, uh, a feds uh, head wide open, you know, uh, you know, under what conditions do you attack a bludgie was what the militia guys were really kind of uh, focused on, at least originally. And that was why they were persecuted as much as they were.
because <laughs> because the bludgies on the other side damn well knew what 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 the change was and went away from protesting and went away from legal interstices and it came down to more people getting ready to use force against the state and that's why the whole militia movement basically got crushed I mean, yeah, there was also some controlled schizophrenia and some more internal problems, which is kind of its own history as well. But suffice it to say, it was better because the militia movement was really focused, was was getting closer to dealing with the state in terms of real politic and getting away from constitutions and interstices and so forth, which which I think was better. Uh, but unfortunately. They didn't really have much of an answer either. It was what, like, what, get a bunch of your best buddies and practice using a rifle, and that's just kind of going to be it. Um, they didn't really have an answer. They never really had a good answer as to how, how do they fund themselves. They tried different experiments, but nothing like, you know, assassination markets. Uh, you know, nothing like along the lines of what Duncan Long wrote about in his book on, you know, the so-called neo-guerrillas, which are basically self-financing guerrilla units. Um, the militia movement never really got that far. So yeah, it was kind of what one one quick note on that. And what what's interesting about an assassination market, too, is you're not, uh, you know, limited to, say, the militia there, the, like you, your local militia. You aren't limited by that amount of people. With an assassination market, you have people from all over the world, which could mean that, you know, you know, if, if you know, a million people toss in just a couple few bucks, I mean, that might make it worthwhile for for a uh, for one of these, you know, assassins to actually go out and do this. So there's a lot, you know, a lot bigger of a pool, which I think is important to mention. Right. And since the the, the various different uh, self-declared militias of one kind or another were all very uh, more kind of like an armed version of a neighborhood watch is really what it kind of came down to. And that was when they were at their best. Uh, yeah, they were kind of limited to geography, weren't they? So there there is that. So that kind of made them all the more easier to track down and harass by the bludgies, which is exactly what happened. Right, right. Yeah, that's uh, that's yeah, that that seems seems to be uh, pretty fair, pretty fair. So uh, in other words, mm -hmm. so in other words, the 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 militia men of one flavor or stripe could not force the authoritarian government to become a hypothetically limited government again. That's kind of my bottom line here. You know, chanting and ranting and even about the right to keep and bear arms and even practicing using rifles uh, did not by itself reign in the power of the state. That's kind of the bottom line here. So assassination markets, I think automatically, just in terms of probability alone, have a much greater likelihood of being much more efficacious than the militias ever were or ever promised to be. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that, that that's true. And I guess another another thing that just kind of popped into my head is if you consider um, as well, like to consider, you know, the, the, the United States uh, and or I guess just the West in general and uh, how just how, you know, how hated, uh, you know, the West is by the Middle East for very good reason. Right. Uh, just to, like you, you've got to imagine, too, that there would be like it'd probably be about 10 different, uh, you know, of these high level officials that would be targeted by everyone from around the, or by a lot of people from around the world. Um, what do you think? Yeah, uh, you know, the, again, that, that's an issue of scope, right? I, I think I think that's that's something to keep in mind. I would also say this: the number one reason why the militia movement fell apart is because, just like any other social movement, it's all based on collective movementism, and so it really was doomed from the beginning, much like the patriot movement or the environmental movement or the women's rights movement or fill in the blank movement. Pretty much, it's 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 the collective movementism one more time, and that's the real reason why it fell apart in the way that it did. Uh, yeah, there are certain idiosyncratic reasons why it did, which for historians is worth exploring because mainstream media likes to cover that stuff up. And there are other lessons to be learned uh, to be sure, but I would still say fundamentally it comes down to collective movementism. Uh, we Americans have to band together and wear camo for some inexplicable reason to basically say the government is evil and basically threaten to uh, you know, hang politicians from lamps in the streets of D.C. And then that was kind of it. Um, you know, yeah, a few people went to jail. Most of them were just scared off and then nothing happened. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I think those are those are all uh, very good points. So, uh, anything else on assassination markets, or we can uh, move in pretty quickly, which uh, you know I don't think is a is a bad thing at all. Uh, but uh, are you ready to move on to uh, avenging angels and talk a little bit about Rayo? I would say this about assassination markets in in parting. It's primarily assassination markets are primarily a gambling pool, right? The presumption of innocence is mainly that the gamblers themselves are not, at least collectively, are not uh, the assassins in question. Now, the assassins in question, of course, or the assassin in question, would, of course, in order to collect on the winnings, would pose and place a bet as if you were a gambler like all the others, but because he bas he predetermined uh, when his target would uh, be going six feet under, um, then, of course, he's just kind of gaming uh, you know, that predictions mark, and then, of course, collecting on the winnings. So, yes, the assassin is a gambler like the other gamblers, but the entire, like, collective pool of gamblers are not assassins. They're just gamblers. Right, and then, and this this is, this would be kind of the, the most interesting part of all of that is, so, so the, so the, 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 the guy, the assassin gets a prediction correct, and uh, then he has to go collect his winnings. Say it's a pool of five million dollars of worth of Monero or something. Uh, I mean, there's there's still kind of the, the the liquidity aspect too. I mean, how how is this guy going to get? And and there's there's ways to do it, but um, I mean, how is this guy going to get his five million dollars out? Um, <laughs> you know, w without getting without getting caught. Uh, now I, I think you know obviously the 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 anonymity provided by Monero, like a minute, like say for example Monero, I think is good. Uh, and would help, but again, you know, if someone just pulls out five million dollars, you know, that's a lot of money, and the IRS comes looking for that if they know it exists. So I think that'd be an, an interesting little, uh, I guess, obstacle. I don't think it's uh, impossible to to overcome, but just just something. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that would be another factor that would come into it too. If an assassin's going to get five million dollars worth of Monero, uh, well, what what the hell am I going to do with this? <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah, there's the technological angle of that. I would just kind of suggest this, just kind of as 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 a parting thought experiment for the listeners to consider. Pretend you're a government prosecutor and you want to wage some lawfare against those pesky American citizens who are undermining your government's authority. And how you're going to do this is because, let's say, a, a different assassination market popped up and let's say a certain uh, – let's make it a high-profile case just to make it easy. Uh, a certain high-profile politician uh, got a sudden case of lead poisoning. And uh, now your superiors, because you're the prosecutor, your superiors have essentially deemed you that you have to take this on and you have to find out who the perpetrators are and you have to bring the assassins to justice, blah, 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 status tripe over and over again, okay? Now, you're the prosecutor. How are you even going to start collecting evidence and using the bludgies who are your subordinates? How are you going to use the bludgies to try and basically prove that even though there was a winner – to that predictions pool, how can you even try to establish a causal chain of evidence that directly ties the winning gambler to being the assassin? How do you do that? Oh, it'd be, yeah, it'd be tough. It would, it would definitely be tough. Uh, and, yeah, and you know, so Bitcoin makes it a lot easier on them. But uh, when we're talking, you know, these these crypto note coins and even you know even future technology, future blockchain technology. I mean, this, this is, it's, it's going to become even more and more difficult for him. Well, here's what I'm saying. Let's say let, – let, let's, let's, let's throw a couple obstacles in here. Let's say as the prosecutor and your bludgies who are your subordinates, let's say they do find – let's say they break – let's say worst case scenario, they break through the wall of anonymity somehow, and they figure out the legal identity of the winning gambler. And let's say they ransack his house with or without a search warrant, of course, because this is America with a K. Um – just because the guy may have won $5 million worth of ferns, you know, in, in terms of in price to Monero, of course, uh, how does that prove that he assassinated, you know, uh, the politician in question? That's that's a good point too. So he, he, he would he would just be guilty of having five having won five million dollars, and they would have to go on to prove, okay, well here is the rifle that he used, ballistics match. Uh, you know he was in the area, he had motive. Right. They they would have to go through that step too. So just because they have that one doesn't mean they can prove the other. So that that is a that is a good point. Yeah. 
Yeah, and especially if the gambler is going to be one of those pesky people who believes that due process should be followed and insists on a jury trial, you know, assuming it goes down that way, as the prosecutor, how in God's name are you going to try and convince a friggin' jury that the accused gambler uh, is an assassin? I mean, at worst, the guy is a gambler, and maybe you can get, maybe you can, uh, you know, tamper with the jury, but doing it legally, of course, during void air. Maybe you could stack the jury with a bunch of uh, really uh, more, <laughs> uh, moralistically puritan uh, conservatives who really take a hard line against gambling. Even if you did that, remember, if you're trying to get the guy convicted on assassination and, and murder and things related to those lines, is probably what they would probably slap him with. You know, it's like okay. So the worst you could you could you could get this guy slapped with is maybe uh, violating some gambling yeah, stuff gambling at that point. Or something, yeah. Yeah, but but it's like no. If your superiors tasked you with getting the assassin, why waste uh, government resources on a gambler? You, you right. see the so, problem. So, yeah. So 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 the question I have, and, and maybe and and because I honestly don't know, and 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 thinking about this in hypothetical future, if this actually became a became a problem for the state, they would probably pass a law against it, saying that you can't. It's illegal to participate in uh, online assassination gambling, you know, gambling pools. Um, you know, th th that'd be in the future. I, I wouldn't be surprised by that at all, right? Um, so so I guess at this point, if if an assassination market existed right now, uh, other than the illegal gambling. Uh, you know, laws. Is there anything on the books that could, uh, I guess, you know, criminalize the, the gambler in this way? Anything that you know? No. I mean, the only other way they might be able to screw over, and this is what I'm kind of concerned about, is the increasing regulations uh, or at least attempted regulations against cryptocurrencies themselves. Because, I mean, you have to pay the assassin in something. Or I should say, oh, excuse me, the winning gambler. You have to pay them in something. So, you know, if, uh, you know, if the IRS got, gets everything they want and FinCEN and all the other regulators, the central planners and such, if they got everything they wanted, um, then, yeah, they might be able to at least make one hell of a halfway decent uh, prosecutorial case that the, ga that the winning gambler really was the assassin. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, and, and and you know, speaking of right now, uh, in the future, obviously, you know, the, if the state gets all the everything they want, then they'll you know regulate cryptocurrencies as they do, you know, just any other sort of, uh, you know, commodity or anything like that. Uh, but as far as right now, the the only the I guess the the major thing that's happening, people, is again the money transmitting law, the money transmitting, uh, you know, charges. Uh, selling Bitcoin over, you know, over over the actual value, like the valued price, and making some profit off of it. That's that's the the main issue here. But if you know, again, if an assassination market was you know here tomorrow, that wouldn't be a problem because they would just be getting, they would just be be receiving it. There wouldn't be a two way transaction happening, right? So what I'm I trying to say that, is, yeah, I, I know what you mean though. Go ahead. What I'm trying to say is that at worst, the prosecutors would have to basically kind of do the, use the Al Capone method. Right. So they couldn't, uh, you know, b you know, back in the day, Al Capone couldn't be prosecuted for what they what uh, Elliot Ness and the other bludgies were actually trying to prosecute him for, which was the mob activity, uh, violating prohibition and such. Right. Um, what they did end up getting him on was tax evasion. And thus, through that use of uh, a ver an early version of the legal shotgun. They basically got him into court and then basically kind of harassed him and all that kind of stuff. Something similar would kind of be the case here. So the the prosecutors really couldn't go after the suspected uh, assassin for the actual assassination. I mean, unless the guy like really screwed up and left fingerprints around the place or something like that, right? It would be more of a forensics thing at that point. Um, but generally speaking, they couldn't. Uh, the only way they could actually go after the assassin would be indirectly – such as through regulating the cryptocurrency and or criminalizing the gambling, not the assassination. Right, right. So, so we're back to we're, we're back to the point where you know it's it's going to be you know so, so even if they even if they can't prove there's a, that pr prove that this individual is the assassin, there's still other routes that they can in, in, inevitably go down. That, and 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 we're back to the legal shotgun. I mean that that's just what it is. We're we're yeah. still we're still going. It's still lawfare. You know if. If the bludgies uh, try one route and that doesn't work, what, like what they really want to do, they'll have 
you know, their backup route. And then they'll have their, and if that doesn't work, they have their backup backup route. Same is the case here. If they can't actually prosecute the assassin, they'll uh, probably the first backup plan will be the actual gambling in general. And then if they can't do that, the backup of the backup would be going after the cryptocurrency itself. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, that makes sense. So, you know, because I, I, I guess for, for, you know, when I was thinking about preparing for this episode, Kyle, I, I you know, I can, like, it, it, I kind of just thought, you know, why don't, the, why doesn't this, an assassination market exist yet? You know, why, why isn't this, you know, why isn't this here? And, and I think that might have something to do with it. <laughs> I think it might have something to do with it. Well, why do you think I was concerned, you know, a couple years ago when the Bitcoin Foundation was having closed door behind secret meetings with that got was openly admitted not too long after, thankfully, by one of their own people, interestingly enough. Um, uh, you know, with with federal regulators like the IRS and the Federal Reserve and FinCEN and DHS and on and on and on was because I saw the writing on the wall. So they were basically trying to go out, trying to figure out a way how to basically corrupt uh, the blockchain even before any serious assassination market could even be formed. Yeah, that's true. So that that's and and the and the only reason they're doing that is because they already knew about Jim Bell. They probably knew already knew about Nick Roberts at least to a lesser extent in some sense. So they're basically trying to preserve the uh, the survivability, the sustainability of the state by trying to cut off any sort of serious uh, pushback to it. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah, before before assassination markets were even really discussed, or I guess really even uh, it's discussed beyond Jim Bell. Uh, yeah, they were coming after Bitcoin. Yeah, they were, they were, you know, that that was their that was their goal, you know. And I think that was what that meeting was all about. Was their their the the Bitcoin Foundation was educating the state and these regulators on what Bitcoin was, so that they could, you know, learn how they can actually regulate it. But more, but more importantly, it was creating. That was the term, creating relationships over and over again. Creating relationships, creating relationships, creating relationships. They said it over and over again. Building relationships too. So it's like, okay, so basically the guys, the Bitcoin Foundation and even that other organization um, were, are basically fascists, literally by definition. Uh, they're trying to kind of merge corporate and state power, at least to some extent, or at least do some backdoor lobbying type stuff. And it's it's rather interesting. So, you know, anybody that does that not only doesn't believe in, in any notion of freedom, liberty, or even Vanu, but what they really believe in is is power and control and also uh, unmitigated and unearned wealth, too, because there's a lot of financial incentives in the present economic climate to basically uh, make the backdoor deals and such, which, of course, for anybody who understands economics, interestingly enough, actually calls negative externalities because negative externalities are actually caused by the state. Different topic for another time. I just figured I'd mention it here to point out that when – you have men like Roberts or Bell coming out with their proposals to basically get rid of the biggest negative externality of all, which is the state. It's interesting to see the push, uh, to see the reaction by the state to basically undermine the tools like crypt, like the blockchain that could be used to basically bring about its, uh, its uh, you know, abolition. So what I'm trying to say is that none of this is by accident at all. <laughs> Of you know, course not. Of course not. And, and and I guess one one kind of more hopeful outlook on this, a hopeful perspective. Uh, I'm going to be having Jamin Baconic on again. Uh, he's he's the guy that uh, builds the ghost pads. Uh, I, I know you've uh, I know I've talked to you about that before, Kyle. But uh, he's working on a lot of really awesome projects, uh, like mesh mesh networking, uh, a bunch of really really incredible stuff. Uh, I'll be having him on. Uh, I'll be talking to him next week. Uh, this is being recorded on November tw or actually November uh, October twelfth right now. So, uh, so so yeah, we'll get some more. I, I, there's 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 some really interesting technology, especially in the open source uh, open source realm, that uh, you know might mitigate some of these concerns. But uh, again, I mean th those they they aren't really there yet. I mean the the technology is there, but making them you know uh, user friendly. Uh, is, is kind of the, the obstacle now, but uh, I mean, I, I think every, I think there's going to be significant developments in the next five years. Uh, but that's that, that's just me. So maybe some of the concerns we're, we're discussing here might be mitigated. I'm not sure. I'll have to you know have I'll have to you know talk to Jamin and figure out uh, just uh, what the hell is going on there. So. 
Well, definitely looking forward to, to, to learning more about that. I mean, maybe there could be something to that, maybe not. Um, all I'm saying is, you know, I, I would I would like to see certain methods developed to, to basically kind of test to see whether they're efficacious or not. So, for example, like we already know that the, like was mentioned earlier, the attempt back in 2013 to actually have an assassination market on, you know, uh, through the, the Onion router thing with the, the Onion-only addresses, that particular effort didn't work. We now know that. That's now a matter of history. Uh, not to say that it couldn't work in some slightly different form in the future, but that particular form, at least in that one case study, didn't work. So at least we now know that. Uh, what I don't like are attempts to even prevent the conditions for experimentation so we can get an answer or not empirically on whether something actually works or not. You know, I'm viewing this more as a scientist, and it's just kind of frustrating that we can't even get anything working in any sense just so that we can find out whether it's sustainable over the long term or not. So if somebody yeah. were to ask me, like, do ass does assassination politics work, that's why I have to couch it the way that I do, Shane, by saying, well, it's potentially efficacious, but frankly, I just don't know. Because it's almost as if it hasn't really even been tried in any really serious, again, long-term uh, context. And that's just kind of where it's at right now, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That is... uh. <laughs> Yeah, definitely true. Definitely true. But but again, I I, I do really I, I really really do like the the idea of assassination politics. I I, I hope there's a you know case study, uh you know sometime in in the near future. And 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 I guess you know as as Nick Roberts uh, said and you know paraphrasing you know some some might recoil at this at this idea. And Erwin Strauss said something similar in How to Start Your Own Country. Uh, you know, some anarchists might recoil at this at, at the idea of uh, you know assassination politics or uh, vigilantism or things like that. But I mean. Obviously, you know, his, you know, you want to talk about, uh, you know, actual, you know, evidence. Uh, Kyle, you're talking about the kind of, you know, looking at these things like a scientist. Well, political crusading obviously doesn't work. Uh, and, right. uh, uh, and and to to actually the, the, the only actual real ways to, uh, you know, for, for for more than just personal freedom, I would say uh, for, you know, I guess more large scale change uh, throughout uh, and not the Obama sort of change. Uh, mm -hmm. The only the only real possibility is for you know that that kind of the, that large scale change that a lot of anarchists want. Uh, I think the re re only real solutions are you know things like vigilantism uh, and assassination politics, and that's probably that's probably uncomfortable to hear. Uh, so, you know, Kyle, we've been we've been complaining about this for for what a, a over a year now, the lack mm -hmm. of uh, discussion of use of force issues. Yeah. So, so and yeah, yet, I think that's I think that's it. And yet, even people in the mainstream zeitgeist, the servile society, they go and watch superhero movies like it's going out of style. I mean, that's very profitable for Hollywood. So so with those kind of fictional depictions of use of force, apparently the audiences don't have a problem with any of that. They don't have a problem with, you know, Tony Stark blasting his opponents to smithereens. They don't have a problem with Steve Rogers, you know, banging people over the head with that shield of his. They don't have a problem with Bruce Wayne beating the living snot out of crooks in Gotham City. They, apparently, they don't have any problem with that because those movies are very profitable. So my question is, okay, you don't have issues with um, artistic, uh, fictional, hypothetical uh, scenarios where you have people, quote-unquote, taking the law into their own hands. Why the hell do you have a problem when it comes to real life? What what what's the switch? What's the difference? Well, I think it's the presentation. It's presented as fiction, and therefore people don't see it as being something that could actually happen in reality. Uh, I think that's what it is. When when people you know look towards entertainment, they don't they don't look to it to see, uh, you know, generally speaking, they don't look to it to to see things that can, that that could actually apply to their real lives. They they use entertainment to escape, uh, generally speaking. Well, then maybe – well, then may I make a proposal myself for the very first – and I don't think anybody else has actually suggested this. And if you don't mind, I would like to use this episode to, pro to quite possibly suggest something that's never been suggested before. Absolutely not. No, yeah, go ahead. Maybe, maybe for anybody who is of artistic bent or a creative writer or, or whatever your skill set is, uh, even people who you know, dabble with you know, comic books or whatever, uh, may I suggest that maybe there needs to be some fiction – that accurately and favorably postulates how assassination markets could work. 
I think the escapism needs to stop, or at the very least, even when people do their escapism stuff, they still can't escape from reality even when they try. Because if there's fiction that actually can say, hey, hey, here's some different ways you may want to consider about how to change the world for the better, people will actually be forced in some sense, even if it's only by force of conscience, uh, to to at least consider some things. And so, yeah, instead of the you know more typical mainstream you know superhero garbage, maybe if they see normal people, uh, you know, using some sort of assassination market in like a near future, uh, maybe a cyberpunk genre would probably be most appropriate for that uh, or aesthetically. Uh, and then basically it's like, oh, well, the government's abolished. Hmm. I guess we have a free America now or, or free Texas or free Illinois or free – hell, even free Canada. Hell, why not, right? Um, that's that, that's a really interesting. I, I'm already thinking of you know a couple of different ways to, to run that through. If you do, if you just take if you take it like a, like a an outright statist, you just kind of walk through their walk through the lot walk through you know just their lives and they're seeing you know all of these assassinations happen. I mean, th there are a lot of ways to do that. That'd be a really really interesting yeah, you know I mean, read or or if it's a video or whatever the hell it is. Right. I mean, people make sh uh, you know not to go on too long about you know issues of aesthetics. Uh, but, but, you know, people make short cartoons all the time and put it up on YouTube. You know, people make flash games and put it up on, on the internet on various different websites where people can play flash games. That you're, you're following a story. It's basically a video game. It's just kind of a more of an indie type thing. Uh, side scroller or point and click or whatever the genre is. Uh, people make comic books or web comics. Uh, you know, the basically kind of like, or there's also the comic strips or, you know, the, that version of it. You know, there's all sorts of different ways. Uh, be, I mean, if somebody even wanted to dabble maybe with a novel, maybe even a novella would be preferable. And heck, while while they're at it, maybe an audiobook version of either the said novel or novella. I mean, whichever medium that some sort of uh, our artist wants to use to try and communicate how assassination markets could work to bring about the abolition of the state – I think it can be done at least from a neutral standpoint, if not outright favorably. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think so, too. I think so, too. And that's that's what I need to start doing for Vanu is uh, kind of that same thing, you know, kind of the how well, how, how could this actually work? But, uh, yeah, that's a very, very interesting idea. A very interesting idea. If uh, if we if I guess if, if we can make things, you know, concrete, concrete through fiction. Right. Yeah, I, and honestly, I think I think that's the next step here because for whatever reason, uh, folks are really hesitant about using the blockchain for anything more than just buying common items. And maybe in terms of its evolution, maybe that's where it needs to be, at least for now. But what I'm suggesting is that a lot of times people will use fiction of various mediums to try and basically suggest a vision of the future. And sometimes that stuff does come, you know, does 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 come to life, at least in some sense. You know, people's values change in terms of um, in terms of what the <laughs> even what some leftists would consider to be certain forms of prejudice. Sometimes that can be, if not ended, at least greatly curtailed through fiction, uh, because it, because depending on how you write a storyline, it can tr you can try and elicit empathy. Uh, you know, some some notion of empathy, and try to have people feel empathy, you know, in, in the audience or whatever, towards uh, certain characters, and then that can get people to challenge their own perspectives regarding, you know, whether uh, you know this bigoted view or that bigoted view that they very well may have may not be the may not be the most efficacious in terms of uh, <laughs> profitability, in terms of uh, you know getting along with people, at least in some sense. Um, I mean, there, there's lots of different there's lots of different ways to skin a cat, and quite frankly, Shane, I am quite sick of a lot of the superhero movies, at least in some way, shape, or form, being used to promote the military-industrial complex. Because bottom line, that is a recurring theme I'm seeing. It's very much this pro-war, you know, kill, 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 over and over and over again. I'm not I'm not surprised, but I wouldn't know. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm not surprised at all. I mean, that's kind of the direction Hollywood's been going for a long time, right? Well, I mean, I mean, there's, I mean, this would obviously be a separate, you know, topic all by itself. But it's, it's very well known the military-industrial complex historically has financed so many Hollywood big-budget, usually action films. It's, 
you know, and so, yeah, they kind of have their own product placement in a lot of ways. Like there'll be certain flyby scenes where there'll be a billboard uh, advertising, like join the National Guard or whatever in like a Spider-Man movie or something. So, you know, that that that's that's kind of, you know, par for the course, unfortunately. And then there'll be other times where it's more kind of in your face. Like there was that movie a couple years ago where it was like aliens invaded uh, some sort of city and the Marines had to fight the aliens or something. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's it's like, oh, there aren't enough so-called terrorists. There aren't enough actual criminals. There aren't enough. You know, Emmanuel Goldsteins, for those of you who remember your, you know, George Orwell fiction, there aren't enough Emmanuel Goldsteins and Osama Bin Ladens and whomever else uh, to, to basically kind of, you know, have the enemy image, according to Neocon Theory by Carl Schmidt. You need an enemy image in order to keep the society together. Uh, and so they have to go create new ones like aliens that Marines have to fight or whatever. And it just gets kind of tiring after a while. And I would really like to see a lot more of the aesthetics, especially... Uh, from from e I would even say even from millennials who really use the internet more so than their than previous generations to really kind of use dare shall I say the power of the internet and and multimedia and whatever else to make their own fiction that can actually show a better world free from the state. Right, right. So uh, uh, anything else there? You want to move on to uh, Avenging Angels? Uh, let, let's. I, I think. I think we need to have a, a lighter, a happier topic with, uh, you know, Flappy Flappy of the Angels, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So okay. Okay. So this is a, this is a, a, something that Rayo proposed uh, in Vonu: The Search for Personal Freedom, uh, Book One. Now there's multiple books, guys, for the LUA listeners that didn't know that. Uh, tinyurl.com forward slash Vonu Rayo, or you can go to vonupodcast.com and go to the free books tab to get the the new book. Uh, as well as, uh, you know, the three or four new libertarian publications, uh, Volney publications that uh, have been released in the past uh, couple of weeks or a few months or a couple of weeks to uh, uh, a month or so. So, so Avenging Angels, something a something Rayo proposed. Uh, it's not as large scale as, uh, you know, vigilantism. Uh, it's, it's not uh, it's not like that. And it's not like assassination politics either. Uh, this is a, a very. Uh, I guess it could have that it could have some some effects like that, but it, it's a little different, isn't it, Kyle? It's much more narrowly prescribed. Um, so, like the assassin, the libertarian jackals that would presumably uh, be working at the behest of an assassination market is obviously used to use force against the state directly, right? Um, and then the vigilantes are just using force against whether it's petty criminals or organized crime or even in certain circumstances against the state itself, uh, the Avenging Angels have a very... Um, <laughs> uh, it's, um, it's not just eye for an eye, it's two eyes for an eye. Their main goal is to basically uh, directly apply Pavlovian psychology to the state. They're basically trying to forcibly teach, quote-unquote, teach the state to not mess with uh, libertarians, venuans, agorists, and whomever else, uh, and, 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 and all that by basically just kind of harassing them and such. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's, let's uh, you know, go into this a little bit. I'll read this uh, excerpt, and then uh, we'll discuss this for the second time. Uh, for, the, for those that came here from the Volney podcast, welcome. I should have mentioned that at the beginning, but I welcomed you last time. I uh, just forgot to do it again. Uh, but uh, you guys already heard our discussion on this. Uh, but it, it seems like is that I've re-recorded podcasts before, Kyle. You know, very rarely, maybe once or twice, and the episode changed like a hundred percent. So, you know, maybe this discussion, maybe we'll, we'll glean some more insight from it. I'm not sure, but uh, let's go ahead and uh, see what Rayo had to say. Quote: One simple retaliatory mechanism is available right now to many libertarians. An individual puts part of his savings in a cache or Swiss account accessible to a friend and makes the following agreement. If he is arrested, so long as he remains incarcerated, his friend each month withdraws a certain sum and spends this for whatever will cause the offending governmental agency maximum annoyance and disability. If the individual should be executed, all of, this, all of his earmarked savings are so expended. This friend is contractually obliged to carry through the retaliation. Even if the victim cannot stop it while incarcerated, this prevents possible intimidation should the government be found out, should the agreement be found out, rather. This agreement is presumably kept secret. The agency and the individual uh, bureaucrats would, however, be told for what they were being punished. It would be pointed out that their victim was not only minding his own business, but was acting in accordance with clear-cut moral principles, that he was not merely a common criminal, 
one of the herd gone astray. Through such a retaliatory agreement, the victim not only increases, uh, increases chances for release, but gains a certain satisfaction. So long as he remains in jail, what better use could he make of his savings? Whether or not such retaliation should be limited to legal activities is beyond the scope of this letter. Uh, end quote. So there it is. So the idea is that if uh, John if, if John Smith is incarcerated, we're going to go back to John Smith here. I like to keep things hypothetical, at least, you know, for, for at least to a certain extent. Uh, so if John Smith is arrested and uh, and uh, John Quincy is uh, is his friend. Uh, so John Smith is in jail. Uh, John Quincy gets his uh, gets this uh, the savings fund. And, uh, his, and, and John Quincy's job is strictly to, you know, use that money to arrest the uh, the, uh, the uh, offending governmental agency. Uh, you know, max, the, the, ma uh, the maximum annoyance and disability. So it, it's an interesting idea, Kyle. So, so I guess there, there, there are two things. If, uh, if, if you're incarcerated and, uh, you know, you didn't, do, you didn't do anything wrong, you know, you didn't violate person or property, you know, there's got to be some self-satisfaction there knowing that, uh, well, they're going to get a bunch of hell for, for messing with me. You know, this is so there's got to be some sort of satisfaction there. But additionally, and, and we talked about this on the on the Vani podcast episode, but, you know, if uh, if uh, the if the avenging angel is causing so much hell uh, <laughs> to this offending governmental agency, it might just help your your chances for release, too. Yeah. Uh, or at the very least, you're kind of uh, establishing a precedent that the bureaucrat shouldn't do this again with with somebody else who is much like yourself. Um, there is something else I kind of want to reiterate from the TVP episode about Avenging Angels, which I want to, well, I'll reiterate here, which is mainly this. The cachet, the savings that are expended for said retaliation, this is not, 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 not a legal defense fund, okay? Legal interstices and due process and paying for a lawyer and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera are not applicable here different the, different saving you i'm sure you can you can have a legal defense fund but it's something different uh than this one yeah the yeah the avenging angels uh funds is not a legal defense fund uh, uh just using different semantics no 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 the reason why these two things are labeled two different things is because they perform completely different functions the funds that are used by the avenging angel are used to essentially um, directly apply Pavlovian psychology to bureaucrats. And this can take a lot of different ways. Um, some of it can be more of a propagandistic uh, flavor, and other times it might even need to veer off into uh, vigilantism, at least to some degree. Uh, can be applied in such a way that, you know, certain mainstream leftists would call pranks, such as, well, I guess the police station just lost their electricity. How did that happen? Boy, they don't have their. I guess their infrastructure isn't very secure. I wonder how that happened. You know, there's or, a lot of different there, ways. Or, you know, or or some sort of embarrassment, like you know, pornographic images appeared on you know the uh, Main Street Police Department or something like that. Like just something embarrassing uh, as all hell. Um, like the, yeah, kind of more of more of the basic stuff. Um, although you know, hacking of you know a government website is a little little more than that, but. Uh, or actually, I don't. I don't know. I'm guessing, you know, sh you know, shutting down utilities versus, uh, <laughs> versus hacking a website might be might be pretty equivalent, huh? Well, the so-called hacktivists of various stripes, you know, are 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 already well known for doing things like DDoS attacks against government websites. I mean, oh, yeah. that's, I mean, that that's already hit. That's already like past history. Um, the specific activities uh, that avenging angels could engage in uh, are quite a uh, a smorgasbord. Uh, there's there's quite a uh, cafeteria selection that they can choose from, and it's really up to their discretion, really limited only by their acceptance of risk plus how m how much in funds they have to expend on said retaliation uh, is, is really kind of the limits there. Uh, otherwise, um, I guess the only other real limit would be, you know, their, their imagination, so to speak, because uh, you can't really put a price tag on that. But right, yeah, so right. I, and I, the I, wanted, I wanted to make one more one more point in regards to the funds. The, the you know keeping what the, the the avenging angel fund is is definitely separate from the legal defense fund because 
if you put, you know, like, and if you're gonna if you're gonna put someone in in, in, this, in this position, they're going and they're going to do it. You guys are gonna be you're, you guys are gonna be close. If they're gonna, you know, assume uh, obviously a lot of that risk is mitigated, but if they're gonna assume, you know, any risk at all, you guys are gonna trust each other. And the last thing you want is for that individual to, uh, you know, be tossed in a cage with you. So, so so the 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 idea here is that uh, you know if you were to uh, you know go on one of the legal defense fund pages, uh, one of those fund fundraising pages uh, that I'm, I think the uh, some of the Malheur Wildlife Refuge folks used, and uh, the organizer and the person receiving the funds is uh, is uh, John Doe, and uh, John Doe gets these funds and things start happening, and you know that's that's openly available, and uh, you know tax will be taken out on that and all that stuff. So, you know, things start happening and, and John's working with uh, John Doe is working with this, you know, hundred thousand uh, dollars worth of, you know, funds raised or something that's going to automatically draw attention to him. And that's not what you want to do. So the, 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 the funds will the, the funds need to remain separate if you're going to, you know, miti uh, you know mitigate some of that risk that'll be, uh, you know, put on your avenging angel. Yeah, exactly. So suffice it to say, the Avenging Angels would be closer to, uh, I guess, a run-of-the-mill vigilante of sorts. Is, is is kind of the idea here. It's you're you're basically trying to, as I, I'll say yet again, you're directly applying Pavlovian psychology to the state, and the way that you're doing that is essentially through a variety of means that are funded by the victim in question. And oh, this is very important. And this was also mentioned in that TVP episode as well. Uh, even if the bludgies kind of get a whiff that whatever the activities are that they're in terms of how they're being harassed or whatever is somehow uh, caused by the victim in question. And even if they drag the victim into yet another round of interrogation or whatever, the victim can quite honestly say, well, now that it's begun, I literally can't stop it. So, you know, you, you know, you guys trying to coerce me into somehow stopping these retaliatory measures is really blowing smoke because even if I wanted to, uh, you know, the other party, uh, whom you guys may or may not figure out who that is, uh, can't, will not stop the retaliation until either a, I am freed and cleared of, you know, uh, of these charges of whatever the heck, uh, or, you know, I'm dead or something, or, uh, the funds are expended, and there's just there's there's nothing left to be. You, know, you can't continue through the retaliation without money to to fund uh, whatever you need. Right, right, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so it, it's a really it's a really interesting proposal, and it, and and it was honestly a little bit surprising, Kyle. Whenever you know like, while I was reading that, it wasn't really surprising, but you know, learning who Rayo was more, I'm surprised he made such a proposal. <laughs> seems seems contrary, well in a sense seems, seems contrary to it seems like it would be too much more attention than he would like to draw to himself or any other Venuan, right well it, it, arguably the concept of, of an avenging angel is kind of like a proto or version on a theme ahead of its time of of the assassination markets right because the assassination markets jim bell's idea is more of a systematic gambling pool to try and bring about the abolition of the state kind of thing right whereas the avenging angel is much more of a limited you know less revolutionary more vigilante uh just punishing these particular uh you know government bureaucrats and so forth with a very specific limited aim of getting so and so released or or whatever else as opposed to the much more grander goal of uh, abolishing the state and so forth so the the issue of scope is actually rather quite profound uh, of of an assassination market relative to the avenging angels the avenging angels have a very much more specific smaller scope the assassination markets have a much more broader, grander scope, and I would say that's probably their biggest difference. Right, right, and I do want to mention, uh, you know, especially for for Liberty Under Attack listeners, uh, they're well aware that, uh, or at least most of them should be well aware that uh, there is a uh, Ben St uh, an audiobook for Ben Stone Seditions Version and Sabotage available on the LUA, LUA website. And for those of you who have uh, read or listened to that, uh, LibertyUnderAttack.com/BenStoneAudiobook. Uh, 
so, so a lot of the things that Ben discusses in that book, you know, could be, you know, very, you know, very interesting strategies for avenging angels. Uh, you know, and obviously, as, as Ben says throughout that book, you know, the, the, the only limit is your imagination. So, uh, and Kyle alluded to that uh, earlier. But, uh, you know, you might glean some and some interesting ideas from uh, from that book. And, uh, you know, or, or even just some some starting points like, oh, I want. So he mentioned this. I wonder if uh, if this would be possible. Well, probably is. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to, you know, uh, you know, give uh, give Ben's book and the, the audio book another plug. Well, not only that, I actually want to, since you mentioned Ben Stone, I would like to draw attention to at least one part of the book that was uh, narrated by uh, the audiobook version, a uh, portion of which was narrated by yours truly, because I got an entire section of myself. Um, the ethics yeah, based. The, the, uh, the, this, the, I think the uh, the section that most people tried to avoid, but yeah. <laughs> and you're, yes, you said, yes. yes, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's kind of how that happened. But it was the ethics based irregular warfare. And I think a lot of the content that Ben Stone wrote about that I did the audiobook portion for an ethics based irregular warfare, I think can be used as inspiration for people to uh if they ever get around to using an assassination mark it could be used to kind of spur some ideas there or probably much more likely uh, f uh that vigilantes and more specifically avenging angels could use could be inspired by some of the content from the ethics based irregular warfare uh because i think ben stone was being a little bit more specific in terms of his ideas uh, that I think would be much more beneficial in a more vigilante context. So he, even though I think his, I think the context he was trying to provide him was was more of a revolutionary, like let's take down the state by force kind of thing, which I think was he was kind of more along the lines of. Well, yeah, but, the, the subtitle is a three part solution to the state or, or something along those lines. Right. But yeah. It's, it's it's yeah. It's a solution to the state. Yeah. It's 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 much more you know more of a grand scale. Right, but but we're still, but regardless of the context or the scope or whatever, we're still dealing with use of force issues, which most people who uh, you know create uh, media of a libertarian perspective within the so-called, I guess, formerly alternative media, now free hashtag free media, I guess, are the people who didn't sell out to Trump. Uh, because those uh, those uh, you know, celebritarians who became the Trump supporters, uh, they know who they are. Um, but yeah, like, like they don't we don't listen to this podcast. Right. But my point being is that, you know, we don't shy away from use of force issues and we shouldn't because it really is about the direct applicability of the non-aggression principle. How far can you stretch that out without actually breaking it? And that's a very important, not just philosophical, but in many ways, even utilitarian consideration as well. And, you know, if we're going to be, you know, uh, if our actions are going to be determined by, you know, first principles and having integrity in keeping with those first principles and not becoming hi hypocrites, such as by supporting Donald Trump or, or whomever else, then I think it would be very uh, significant for us to actually kind of take a look at use of force issues of whatever kind. You know, and and not not just the utilitarian. You know, do you shoot or you know do you shoot someone or stab someone in this you know use of force scenario versus that use of force scenario, but also because that that's more tactics, but also even in terms of strategy, right? This let me okay. This is perfect to end out on the strategy of an avenging angel is different from the strategy of. Uh, of like the libertarian jackals in an assassination market. They are different strategies. They do different things. Both of them are different ways of using force. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah, I, that's definitely I, true. And so, you know, I, I know a lot of uh, celebrity, I would say more of the minor celebritarians now who who like to try, you know, kind of pussyfoot a little bit and they would rather talk about economics and lecture people about economics and property rights all day. But then when it comes down to directly applying the non-aggression principle, they're basically kind of like uh, anything outside immediate self-defense uh, is is like murder or whatever. And I, I, I think they're being intellectually dishonest, quite frankly, uh, whether they intend to or not. It's it's just kind of like they're just not thinking or they're scared or they're being susceptible to some sort of mind control of one version or another because they want to get along with people. So they think and or they're controlled schizophrenics. So, of course, they're going to contradict themselves and so forth. I mean, whatever the reason is, doesn't really much matter. The point is, I find it rather telling that in much alternative media being created these days, whenever use of force issues come up, 
uh, the cowardliness of most people producing said content uh, is rather quite apparent, and you can really kind of see who has the who has the courage of their convictions and who doesn't by their willingness to actually discuss use of force issues. And even even if they're a pacifist, see, pacifists actually have to have courage of their convictions by saying, you know, you don't can't even do self defense, right? Because they at least have to stand on something. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I look for the people who like to do the whole shift, you know, shifting sands little routine. Well, well, it's only immediate self-defense, but anything more than that is murder. Poppycock. Poppycock. The non-aggression principle, <laughs> the non-aggression principle is directly applicable to vigilantes specifically because um because it is perfectly acceptable and within the bounds of self-defense to also defend uh others as as a third party against 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 a coercer so the fact that the the folks who like to pussyfoot around and shift with the winds of political expediency of whatever the latest uh, celebritarian trend happens to be because if we talk about use of force issues we're going to be labeled quote-unquote brutalists or or whatever uh attack label happens to be uh because this this is an info war believe you me it, it it is as real as a heart attack unfortunately then it, it just kind of goes to show that well if we're if if any of us us or at least me uh if i'm going to be at least trying to be a consistent libertarian besides talking about issues of property rights economics and self-ownership we also have to talk about the nap and use of force and you know the difference between uh, self-defense and murder, as well as vigilantism and so forth. And so I find it rather interesting that the avoidance of use of force issues generally and of vigilantism specifically or of vigilante or use of force-like strategies like an avenging angel or assassination markets are just – are treated as, oh, we can't go there. It's not on the allowable card of three-by-five uh, opinion. You know, it, I mean, I mean, that's just kind of what it is. And again, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not saying y'all should, you know, don a, a pair of tights and hop on rooftops and, you know, go attack muggers. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that can we at least have public discussions in at least some form um, regarding under what conditions, you know, use of force can be uh, can be done under whether uh, whether on. Um, principled grounds or even utilitarian grounds i would and heck shane i mean even i would be open to uh you know different celebritarians of one flavor or another you know to like public debates uh if they think i'm being uh, a little too uh you know whatever or whatever label they want to use against me uh in in terms of well hey can we at least have an avenging angel here and there right um because I'm, I'm sure some of them are probably going to think that any sort of use of force outside immediate self-defense is going to be, is going to be, you know, against the non-aggression principle. And my interpretation of the non-aggression principle is the right one because I said so. Instead of actually, you know, thinking through things axiomatically. So, I would be open to public debates on that. But uh, let's see you're, you're who all, starts. You're always, up. You're, you're always open to debates, man. <laughs> I know because I know because it's also, and I agree with Sam Conkin on something here. That the use of public debates and all that is also a way to expose shysters and cowards and folks who are hypocrites and controlled schizophrenics. And that lets the audience know uh, where, uh, where certain people who claim to have all the answers really are like. And that – and by exposing frauds and con men can actually help – uh, lower everybody's opportunity cost. So you're not spending years of your life as unfortunately I used to. Years of your life, you know, watching certain individuals, listening to certain individuals, or as some associates of mine have done over the years, even directly financing legal defense funds of certain individuals that maybe they shouldn't have, uh, then maybe we can kind of, you know, lower opportunity costs and th therefore redirect all that effort towards other forms of direct action that actually have a realistic chance of working. That's all I'm saying. Right, right. So let's begin to close out here now. We started out in, that, in the in, in part one of this uh, this unexpected series discussing vigilantism, and we went into a lot of detail. And I laid out, uh, you know, uh, I guess kind of a a potential way that vigilantism could be used to, you know, push forward the push push forward anarchism and also, uh, you know, help with public perception because unfortunately the uh, the asshole, uh, you know, uh, uh, syndicalist variety with their black block kind of gives us a bad rap. That's the only real uh, public public public. Uh, attention that anarchism gets and uh you know 
<laughs> that, that's that's uh, certainly uh, certainly not good. So to reiterate that, if you know anarchist vigilant uh, you know vigilantes would uh, you know go out there and you know just you know basic you know you, like uh, like what uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, why well, can't I remember his name now? The uh, the real life superhero. Uh, Phoenix Jones. Jones. Phoenix Jones. Go out and do the Phoenix Jones routine. Uh, and maybe a little more serious. Uh, well, I, I don't want to say that. So, the, different flavor. Different diff, flavor. Because remember, flavor, yeah. Because yeah. remember, just just to kind of reiterate, remember he had he was very big on having cameras. He was very big on. Uh, yes, kind of uh, pushing back against the violent drunks, which I guess somebody has to do. Uh, but that's not quite the same thing as going after a mugger, much less organized crime. So again, to each his own. Not criticizing him necessarily. Right, so, 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 a, so a little more, a little more hardcore in principles, like the the principled aspect. Where, yeah. Yeah. So 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 the the anarchist vigilante would would uh, you know go out there and you know defend property rights, whether it's uh, you know defending uh, you know a woman from being raped or uh, you know a guy from being uh, you know stolen from or whatever the scenario is, uh, going out there and and you know actually de you know defending property rights. Uh, which I think you know would be would be a really really fulfilling thing to do for especially for a proprietary anarchist, but uh, beyond that, uh, I mean, uh, do that you know kind of get uh, get that experience, uh, kind of uh, you know as Phoenix Jones did out there, get that get that get that experience, and move up to to you know more uh, you know uh, you know the 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 maybe the unsolved crimes, maybe the the case is not being paid attention to by the by the police and uh, you know doing their job for them you know doing the, doing the bludgies job for them and I, I don't know how this would how if this would necessarily be a good thing but uh, you know dropping off you know these violators at the police station with like a note saying hey you guys uh, you you didn't catch this guy but he uh, was trying to rape this woman or whatever the hell whatever the that, hell that, it was that, Here, that's the bad here's, man here's that's... here's video here's video evidence you guys do with him what you want to and if that happens you if that happens enough you know the media is going to catch wind of that. And uh, you know, kind of you know, put like the uh, the volunteerist symbol on there or something, uh, wh whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, uh, yeah, you know, kind of kind of switch that public perception uh, and, and, and 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 to a point where uh, where the, the you know the the mainstream media won't ignore it. You know, just as they gave Phoenix Jones a bunch of media attention, uh, they can ignore it, and that could you know if 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 the anarchist vigilantes are doing the doing the bludgies job better than they are, then uh, you know that could swing you know very much in favor of the anarchists. And uh, then, as we kind of mentioned before, you know, kind of uh, once you get more experience and maybe you get a uh, committee of vigilance or something along those lines that Ben Stone talked about, then you, you work your way up to, uh, you know, the uh, organized crime and then uh, eventually, you know, maybe to the state. I don't know. It's, it just that, that seems like a, a really, a really interesting way to change public perception about anarchism. Uh, so, 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 yeah, you know, the vigilantism aspect, the assassination politics and the avenging angels, there's certainly a connection there. Yeah, these are different strategies and tactics of how to use force in ways that are actually principled. Again, ethics-based irregular warfare, as Ben Stone would put it, I think is is a little bit wordy but accurate way of, of kind of describing it. It was interesting what you were saying a moment ago about, you know, what if the anarchist vigilantes actually did the, the job of the police better than they did by, like, working cases and maybe uh, dropping off the perps at the police station or whatever with, with a note or symbol? Well, essentially, that's what Batman does. Um, of course, the vigilantes in question would, of course, be more principled than Bruce Wayne ever was, because remember, his character arc is all based on personal tragedy. There's not really a set of ideas, really. Um, that actually belonged to a specific character in Batman's rogues gallery, which is a topic for another time, because actually he was principled. He was also described as the Aristotle in tights. Uh, discussion for another time. But suffice it to say, yeah, it, it's kind of what you're suggesting is kind of like what Batman does, but based on principle, which I think is a, a better route to go. And then depending on how well that goes, they work themselves work up to organized crime. And then, you know, again, kind of like how some Batman storylines were, there was always, you know, government corruption. Well, that could be an angle that could be worked into that would then eventually lead to abolishing the state or at least kind of moving that along. Yeah, so so in, so instead of uh, you know anarchist libertarians, you know looking into and maybe just conspiracists more generally might be a better way to put this, looking into Pizzagate, why don't uh, the anarchist vigilantes go down to uh, you know go down and actually kind of uh, you know solve the case for them, right? <laughs> well, remember too, and and this is something to kind of keep in mind is that there are too many people who like to participate in some form of a self-generating media circus because they consider it a hobby, because it's something they can do. 
you know, before they go to work, after they come back from work, you know, in between doing chores and all that. Being a vigilante or or an or an avenging angel or or a libertarian jackal or any version or or, or any real use of force actually requires discipline, it requires dedication, and it also entails risk. You know, being a, let me put it this way, man. Being a conspiracist doesn't really involve a lot of investment. Not really. As long as you have access to internet and you have some time to read some things, um, even if you have a better understanding of the world than most of most folks in the servile society, all the conspiracists have to do is kind of put two and two together, understand a few things of history like the reality of false flags and, and a few other concepts, and they can become conspiracists pretty much overnight uh, using some leaps of logic which are not necessarily – uh, provable by the facts of a case, uh, so to speak, because and sometimes constant some violations of uh, Hanlon's and Occam's razor too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, there's that too. So it, there's not a lot of investment uh, that 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 it takes to take somebody who's, let's say, the average uh, inhabitant of the servile society and turn them into a conspiracist, even though they may mean well, uh, genuinely, even if they mean well, it doesn't take a lot. It really, really doesn't. Um, to become a vigilante, however. Much like I said in the that previous oh, episode, we, yeah, the, and when we talked the about training, it, I mean, the, the training, and and also kind of the fun, the the funding avenues too that could be there. I mean, yeah, it, it would take some, it would take some, it would take some massive commitment. It would, it couldn't just be a hobby. No, the, it would be a calling. It would be a vocation, your vocation that you have chosen voluntarily, of course, to basically use force in a principled way, that ethics-based irregular warfare, so to speak. To actually bring about certain ends, whether it, whether it's the strategy of the avenging angel, or whether it's as a libertarian jackal, or just a garden variety vigilante, or or whatever the context is, the point is, is that you would be. It's a vocation. That's that's kind of the bottom line here. Um, and so the notion of it being like a hobby that goes away like that. It's 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 not like that at all. Unfortunately, I get a kind of a I usually don't talk about my feelings much publicly, but I will mention this here. I very much get an intuitive feeling that way too many content producers in the alternative media are hobbyists. They're not doing real research. They're not thinking things through. They're not interviewing certain people, uh, whether it's for an article or, or a video interview or a podcast or whatever. They're not actually interviewing people who have like, who are like special, who have specialized knowledge in something to try and learn something that can actually be beneficial to their audiences. It's just a lot of, it's a lot of mutual masturbation, quite frankly, and I'm sick of it. And what I think is very good about uh, some content producers, especially the ones I associate with, is that those are the folks that usually are breaking new ground, there's original material, and there's also some elaboration on that material as well to try and really make it as good a product as possible for the benefit of the audience. So the audience, you know, listeners, readers, viewers, whatever, can actually make informed decisions about how they actually want to deal with the world such as it is. Exactly, exactly. You know, if they want to become vigilantes, if they want to start an assassination market or whatever it may be, uh... I mean, there's, but yeah, there's, there's, there's information out there, and we've, we've done episodes on, on those things. But I guess, uh, I, I guess, what, what are your, uh, what, what are your closing thoughts, uh, on, you know, on these, uh, on these, on these, these, the overall conclusion for, for, for part, part one as well? What would you leave listeners with? I would say that you, the any sort of real vocation or deep commitment to using force in a principled manner is not for everyone. Uh, there are other avenues of direct action that, for many people, are more, shall I say, tastefully acceptable to their current preferences. And so for those folks, I would suggest that other forms of direct action, such as lifestyle changes, might be, well, more in accordance with where they're kind of coming from. And that's the other thing, too, Shane. A lot of people complain about the system such as it is, and even if they do oppose it based on uh, principle or even in a systematic way, they systematically oppose the system such as it is. Um, a lot of times if they engage in just a, a certain selection of lifestyle changes, a lot of their grievances go away because a lot of their grievances really only involve how they get screwed over by the state and, and its uh, crony corporations and such 
uh, not so much how the state kind of affects kind of like everybody, more or less. And so for those folks, yeah, if you engage in some lifestyle changes, you can make yourself as invulnerable to coercion as possible. And if there are folks who don't necessarily want to go along the lines of uh, vigilantism, the libertarian jackals in an assassination market, or even as an avenging angel, but they really just want to do lifestyle changes, I think uh, some other methods more along those lines would be more suited to their tastes. And if that's all they're interested in, I still think that those people are still much better than the political crusaders who like to waste everybody's time with uh, supporting uh, you know, uh, a Trump type or whatever. Oh, and I, I wouldn't say they, they're 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 a lot better than than other folks. I would say you know whether it's uh you know whether it's a uh, you know an anarchist vigilante uh, vigilante or um or even if it's just someone who wants to pursue van nomadism or you know minimal steel boating. I think in any of those folks that you know withdraw completely from politics, you know deal with their controlled schizophrenia and pursue their own personal freedom, or in the case of Vanu, you know invulnerability coercion. I think that's that's just absolutely fantastic, and I think they're both just as good as the other. Sure, that's that's definitely that's definitely a, a one way of kind of viewing it what, because I is, think what, at this one point is, one is one is I guess uh, and you know I have nothing wrong no, nothing wrong with you know rational self interest. One of them is more selfish than the other. You know, uh, having yes. that uh, you know I guess the approach that we've talked about in these past two episodes those would be more I guess unselfish. And uh, you know, per just you know, pursuing your own your own freedom or invulnerability to coercion uh, would be more selfish. But that's not a bad thing. You know, don't, don't believe the left on that when they uh, when they when they uh, <laughs> when they uh, call you greedy or anything. No, just, just fuck them. Yeah. So so what I'm saying is that there are there are individuals with a variety of tastes and all that, and there are some people who are pretty much willing to risk going to the wall, as it were. And those are the folks who would probably be more disposed who if they were still clinging to the notion of limited government, would have gone and joined a militia. But rather, instead of that, they would be much better off either being an avenging angel, a vigilante, or even a libertarian jackal in an assassination market, right? And then there are other folks where they don't necessarily want to go along those lines in terms of using force against either private criminals or even the state, but they really just want to do kind of lifestyle changes. And if they just kind of do that consistently, yes, uh, then, um, then that kind of solves whatever their grievances are, and then that's that's pretty much where you know their that their path takes them. Exactly, exactly. So, I guess anything else you like to leave listeners with? Yeah, don't don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. If if people just want to have lifestyle changes, and you know go live on a sailboat, or they want to, to go country shopping or whatever, that should not be used as an excuse to somehow pit them against like the vigilantes who do decide to use home court advantage to directly um, confront uh, the system as it is. I think these are these are different um, forms of direct action that on the whole are always more preferable than political crusading and reformism and so forth. Right, right. And I want to kind of end on Kind of the, the the purpose and the reason I wanted to do this episode because Kyle and I have talked about the the vigilantism aspect for at least a handful of times in the past you know six months or so, and I, I laid it out twice in that first set once in that first episode just uh, a few moments ago about why I, how I think you know vigilantism could be used, uh you know to, to to kind of help change the public perception of anarchism and maybe even get you know more folks on board for those that that if that's the route that they want to pursue, uh you know more power to them. Um, but you might want to consider vigilantism as well, because I don't see how that could, I, I mean, if, if it's, if it's done right by principled individuals that aren't controlled, controlled schizophrenics, I think it might, uh, you know, it might, might fare good results. But as far as the, the other, the other two topics, I mean, they, they, they go, they go kind of hand in hand. They're, they're different. The scope is different as we talked about, but at the same time, you know, the avenging angels thing is an interesting proposal. And the assassination politics, I want I, I, I honestly just want to talk about that again, and it's related because the blockchain technology is here. and I, and I think I'm honestly getting ahead of myself and and Kyle, you mentioned it uh, you know when we were talking about that, you know people just want to use it to buy and sell or maybe uh, you know use it for, use it use it as a tool for financial independence, which is which is just fine. And maybe that's where it needs to be at right now. Maybe the technology isn't isn't developed enough. maybe uh, I don't know, I don't know. I, I, I don't, hold on, I don't, hold on. Hold on. On that point, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But on that point, I don't. I let me let me be clear about something. I don't think it's an issue of technology. I think it is absolutely one hundred percent 
an issue of, uh, I guess, I guess emotional maturity in the sense, and, and I guess, uh, I guess you could say in a psychological sense that people that they're that those individuals aren't ready to use that technology in that particular way to bring about the abolition of the state. Not yet. That's right. what I was. That's okay, what I'm trying enough. to say. I, I don't I don't think the emotional maturity is there. I, I don't see it. Where the emotional maturity is right now and for the foreseeable future is buy and sell and financial independence. And then and it just kind of just stops there. It doesn't well, go I, further. I, guess, I, I would say I would say that, uh, you know, from what I've seen. Uh, there are, you know, obviously uh, there's there's steam it, you know, problems that it has or, or whatever that we that we've talked about. Uh, you know, there, there's 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 other applications that are that are a lot less risky that I think people are experimenting with first. You know, kind of the uh, the the I guess the the blockchain based uh, uh, social media or blogging platform. Then you have kind of the 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 other the other kind of applications that are that are being uh, put forth. Uh, you know, there's 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 been you know attempts at uh, you know having uh, the the DNS, the domain name servers on on blockchains as well. That really hasn't developed, uh, you know, at, at all, unfortunately. Uh, so so I, I think I think you're right, but I would also say that it, it might be that there are other easier, less risky applications that uh, I think people see a, a the bigger demand for. You know, kind of you know trying trying to avoid that censorship, which. Uh, and and uh, Dolan J. Tramp actually put out uh, a tweet uh, saying he uh, that uh, with all the fake news they should you know pull the licenses from these news these news organizations. So censorship may be a very real issue, and I don't think that's a bad a bad route to focus on, uh, you know, as an application for blockchain technology. So I think that has something to do with it too. Is the what people what what some of these developers see as, you know, coming up closer. Uh, I think that is, you know, some of these risks that might that might be coming up in the next few years. So I think it might have something to do with it too. But uh, and I guess I guess also too to get back to, to get back to my point, it hasn't been blockchain technology has not been around for this long. And I think I I, I think you know with with as with as fast as op this open source technology moves, I think I honestly expect too much too quickly. Uh, but that's kind of I mean maybe that's just the way maybe that's kind of the uh, <laughs> the, the the way I guess maybe that's just the way that I've I've kind of you know gotten used to technology is that you know changes happen all the time, so so maybe maybe it's not time yet maybe it's not uh and, and yeah maybe I'm just getting ahead of myself you know we've got Monero now where's the assassination market like maybe I need to take a step back and and uh, <laughs> and you know give give the blockchain blockchain technology it's a little time to develop here uh and kind of get out of this uh, this ICO bubble as well uh but. I guess that all of these three things tie together, and uh, as I said, that I, I really just wanted to put out that kind of you know idea of uh, you know vigilantism being used to to change kind of the perception of anarchism. Uh, I I think that these are three really really interesting ideas, and obviously uh, you know as, as Kyle said, the lifestyle changes are are great. You know if you pursue vandalism and minimal minimal sailboating, fantastic. If you're one of those folks that, I mean you you really want to do what you can to bring you to bring this free society into fruition. Then you know these are these are some options that might help might help that uh, you know happen faster. So uh, I guess with that said, anything else? Yeah, um, by their acts ye shall know them, and by the actions that people choose to engage in, you can pretty much reliably gauge just how dedicated they are to their professed uh, principles. And I think it will be people individuals' actions that'll be the final word. On uh, on how just dedicated they are to their professed principles. So if you have somebody doing one method versus another, uh, and especially the effectiveness of it, um, and even more so if there's uh, like open source material that basically shows that let's say method A is more effective than method B in terms of direct action and so forth, but for whatever reason, let's say hypothetically most people went with the less effective method for whatever reason then that kind of shows you the dedication those people have to their professed principles too. Because obviously if they really were dedicated, then why wouldn't they use the other method that's much more, you know, efficacious and so forth? That That's kind of something to consider too. So by their actions, ye shall know them. So we'll see in the upcoming years how many people actually become vigilantes, libertarian jackals, or avenging angels. And we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, 
Uh, that's all I've got for, for, for this episode. I uh, hope, you, hope you enjoyed it. I really do. Uh, I want to go ahead and plug uh, two other things before I let you go. First off, I still have, uh, you know, uh, Liberty Under Attack custom uh, direct action over political crusading shirts. $15 a pop, free shipping, and I'll send you some free goodies along with that. LibertyUnderAttack.com forward slash shirts. We accept crypto uh, and FRNs. Uh, if you want to do PayPal, that's certainly fine. You know, maybe that's maybe that's better for you. Uh, but obviously crypto preferred, but uh, but either way, either way. And uh, also, uh, like I said at the beginning of this episode, there are two. I, I've gotten really good at this, actually, guys. Uh, you know, getting getting episodes out on Patreon for, you know, whether it's early access or, you know, exclusives. I don't want to be released on the feed for at least uh, quite some time. 